All right. Okay, we will call the meeting to order of the Library Advisory Commission, regular meeting of Monday, April 3rd. And we're here at the Scotts Valley Branch. May I have a roll call, please? Lindsay Bass is absent. Jennifer Mount, absent. Mary Ripma, absent. Pamela Wool, here. Trisha Wynn, here. Uh, Vice Chair Rena Dubin, here. And Chair Mike Turney, here. Um, let's see, we'll have a motion to adopt the agenda. I move to approve the adoption of the agenda. Is there other additions? Thank you, Yolanda. You have one? Yes, there yeah. is an addition to the agenda. Thank you. Um, the addition to the agenda is a to for the board for the commission to discuss National Library Workers Day. Typically, every year the commissioners take cookies out to the branches, and so I just wanted to make sure that you all had that discussion this year to determine what you want to do for Tuesday, April twenty fifth. Good. We'll put that in under member reports. Mm -hmm. And with that addition, um, all in favor? Or do you want roll call every time, or we just do all in favor for one person? Right. You should be able to just do that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So moved. Um, we'll go on to oral communications. Anyone from the public who would like to address the Library Advisory Commission at this time can step up to the podium and do so. Yes. Cynthia Matthews, <laughs> please do. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Dance around, <laughs> you can do anything you want. Well, I'm actually um, here this afternoon, evening, representing downtown forward. Should I be back there by the chair? You can hand it out and then, be, yeah, okay. then go ahead and have a seat because that way we can treat Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, I know that uh, one of the main items is covered in the director's report um, coming up at your next item, and that is that the city council. Uh, approved finally all the permits, all the entitlements for the downtown branch, which is the end of a long stretch. <laughs> um, but one, I think you um, you know that downtown board was started about four years ago to be the collaborative advocate for the downtown project, the main downtown library. The flagship library, um, in addition to many other components important to downtown, mm -hmm. and it it took a lot of work over mm -hmm. those years. And I want to thank you, Library Advisory Commission, for being with us mm -hmm. as a community representative, straight out of the shoot and through everything. Mm -hmm. That was really important. And what I've given you here is a list of the organizations that, over time, supported the downtown library affordable housing project. It is impressive. And this is both the, the groups that endorsed Downtown Forward conceptually in the beginning and also came on board with measure no on over. Mm -hmm. And so this is really, I think, the, the gold star list of mm -hmm. community organizations representing just an incredibly diverse range of stakeholders. And so it was uh, 2022 was largely spent um, fighting the Measure O campaign. And as you all know, it was a very decisive voice yeah. in the community who wanted that project to happen. And all kudos to the friends as well, who were so critical. Mm -hmm. and, all, and many of you tabled and <laughs> did other good things. Um, and I want you to know that the council approval, we are going to continue being the collective community advocates for this. And there's really a role for it. Just this week, we generated a dozen letters from many of these organizations for the housing partners, Eden Housing and for the Future Housing. And they, I think, as you know, they were trying to hit a very tight deadline for affordable housing funding, opens once a year right in the spring. They are now able to apply for those grants. So we were able to get really strong supportive letters, which are important when these things are ranked and reviewed. And I just want to let the library system know, we will do that for you. <laughs> As you are looking for letters of support, call on us. And, and we have a good network of people that want to, to see this through the completion. And we're also working with the friends now on the beginning conversation about the capital campaign mm -hmm. for downtown. So um, we are at your service. Thank you for your support. All along the way. Yes. Thank you very much, Cynthia. Thank you for bringing us up to speed on this. So, next steps. I mean, what, what, 
would you like the Library Advisory Commission to do at this point? I personally think that uh, this is personal opinion. Um, last year, we, and particularly the library system, I appreciate, operated under the cloud of being a public agency, can't get involved in the campaign, and was in fact, I think, had so much pressure to not say a thing mm -hmm. about the campaign, mm -hmm. even if it was strictly factual. So I think we've been liberated from that black cloud now. And um, I know that there is conversation between the library system, the friends, the housing advocates, the downtown association. Let's let's really work together for visibility, positive visibility, mm -hmm. um, consistent messaging, celebrate, celebrate, celebrate. I will say, I think one thing that the that LAC, that the library system could do could be a report back to the community on the success of Measure F. Oh my God, it is so amazing. Mm -hmm. You think what this system did, it's now maybe six years since the passage, mm -hmm. but you got COVID, you got fires, you got, you know, all these things happening. And you know as well as anybody the work, and we have three more branches coming on mm -hmm. this year. It is astonishing. Mm -hmm. And I think, and many of you will appreciate this, I think public institutions don't say enough about mm -hmm. doing the job well. Yeah, when we do things and right. so mm -hmm. there are no constraints. Tell that story. <laughs> so I think that, and certainly we're, um, you all know, um, B40 is opening mm -hmm. in May. And um, I think we're looking at that as an opportunity to say, what is another big win mm -hmm. for the community? I mean, you all know, there's not a branch that opens that people aren't just out of their brains. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. Thank you. I, I would say that's run with it okay. um, in every way possible. We'll Thank do you. that. And, mm -hmm. you know, thanks for all your help on uh, getting the downtown library. You did a great deal of work on that. And if people who don't know it, Measure <laughs> S was in no small part because of your effort. You were a force behind that bond measure. Thank you, just but not it. alone. And that's, it was, it was just so important to have so many different committed, strong partners. And well, you're a good leader. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of not wanting to blow your award, I think, uh, <laughs> I think that advice is good. <laughs> Very good. Well, uh, thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, Cynthia. Mm -hmm. Are there any other oral communications? Seeing none. Um, we will go on to report for our library director. Good luck. Thank you, Chair Termini. Um, I have included my written report in the packet for the board to review. I'm just going to highlight a few items today. Um, first off, I just want to acknowledge, I know that Commissioner Bass is not able to be with us today uh, due to unforeseen circumstances, but I did want to just recognize all of the great work that she's done over her, her term with yes. us. She is terming out. Um, we're, we're sad to see her go, but we certainly understand and we will be looking forward to having our next commissioner appointed. At this time, we do not have a candidate that has been referred, um, but we continue to try and work with the supervisor's office to make sure that that position does get filled. Um, so with staffing, uh, we are continuing to recruit. As you can see, we've yes. got some of those vacancies filled. We still have a number that we're trying to um, complete. Uh, we have a few library assistant threes who are going to be coming on board with us uh, finally in April. Great. We're so excited. Um, and then, of course, with the opening of the Brand Supporty Branch, we will need the additional staff because we've been borrowing them from one place to another. Um, so we're really excited about that. Um, I do want to call your attention, and I'll talk a little bit about this as we go through the budget. Uh, in our budget preparation, uh, we did find out from the city of Santa Cruz that our cost allocations that the city charges us for the services of human resources, our uh, uh, risk management, thing, finance, things like that uh, was going to be doubling. Um, and so um, we have worked in agreement with them that they will hold off on increasing that and they're going to honor the uh, service agreement that we have with them for now for the next two years. Um, but we do anticipate that that will 
uh, increase at the end of the two year period. And so therefore we are going to be collaborating with the city to do an RFP to hire a consultant that can really do an analysis on what's the best model for our library organization moving forward. So it will certainly go up, but yes. hopefully not double. As you well, we I think we need to make some some decisions in the next two years about do we remain uh, having the city provide those services for us, or do we uh, break away and form our own full JPA where we have our own finance director, our own HR director. Those are the questions that we're hoping that the consultants will be able to bring us back some cost information on and what's the best model for us. So that will be going to the board for the RFP request, but also we'll be bringing any information that we get back to the Library Advisory Commission so that you all can uh, provide input on what's the best model for us moving forward. But that's a big piece uh, that we're going to be accomplishing over the next two years. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, with our facilities, as you know, we're so excited. Grand opening of the Brand Safari Library yeah. is coming Saturday, May 13th, and we're anticipating that will be from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. on that day. Um, we're looking for, we have such a great turnout for Garfield Park because it's in the neighborhood, so we're anticipating a lot of foot traffic. Uh, when I was over the other day, um, taking uh, some of our friends in the library through, when the, when the neighbors was walking by, I was like, is the library open? <laughs> so the community is excited about this. We're excited to see it open. As you know, we've been through some trying times these last few months with the atmosphere of rivers. And so I did want to point out that our Felton Library branch did serve as a FEMA Disaster Recovery Center uh, they were able to set up and help residents with filling out their claims for damages, getting support. They were handing out brooms and mops and all kinds of stuff. Um, and so we were really uh, pleased to be able to participate in that manner with FEMA when the community needed those services most. Um, as such, FEMA, have, they've reached out, the county and FEMA have reached out that they want to potentially establish the Felton Library as a future DRC as well. So we'll be looking forward. There's more to come on that front. And I, and I'd also mention that Aptos might. Yes, Aptos may, correct. Aptos may become a disaster recovery center as well. So finally, I want to just call your attention to a visit that we had from Assemblymember Don Addis at the Capitola Library. Uh, Commissioner Wynn and I met with Don Addis and her aide uh, and gave them a tour of the Capitola Branch Library. Uh, she was very pleased. We told her she has to come back and see uh, the uh, La Selva Beach, which is in her district as well as Aptos once that opens. Uh, she was very supportive and she said, if you need me to write a letter, let me know. So there's <laughs> another one of those yeah. letters, writing letters. Uh, so uh, that's all I have for you. I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. I have yes. one question. Um, so thanks very much. And these are so helpful, Yolanda, in terms of giving us context. But I had a question about the volunteer coordinator assistant. Mm -hmm. So you have it on held mm -hmm. and i was just when i moved to S santa cruz 10 years ago my very first stop was to the volunteer office at the library saying i'm here in town i love libraries what can i do and um i just really see the value of that and i'm wondering kind of what the plan is so i'm going to talk a little bit about that when i go through the budget mm -hmm. so we'll do that yes we'll do that. so okay. what i would like to do is take that position it's a half-time position uh, it is a an assistant volunteer coordinator, and so what I want to do is fold that into a library specialist position, so we get someone who is much more focused on really working with the volunteers and overseeing volunteers, and then also working with our marketing department on those special events uh, to really Great. provide some support there. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll move on to a report from the Friends of the Library. Bruce. Excuse me, I have a lot to go through, so I have my <laughs> Good, good. Um, Chair Tremini, Commissioner, it's nice to see you all. 
Um, let me start with recover and thrive, which I have mentioned before. This remains really our major focus for the first part of the year. Um, we all, I think, recognize the impact, the negative impact on learning and socialization on the children because of the pandemic. I know I see it in my own family. And um, Recover and Thrive is a library-based initiative to try and see if we can't change that, make that turn around a little bit. Um, it has a focus on improving reading skills using the library setting for the delivery mode. Um, we have committed to $50,000 to launch this program. Um, initially, there will be a pilot program um, targeting third grade students at Del Mar um, School. This was determined by uh, the library, by the County Office of Education, by the, the Live Oak Superintendent. Um, you may have heard uh, Eric say that, you know, when before third grade, then people, the kids are learning to read. After third grade, they're reading to learn. It's a very critical transition um, period. So uh, what we're doing is identifying a group, um, working with, as I said, the County Office of Education. Um, this will be a six week program. There will be a teacher coach. There will be a series of instructors who will work together. We're currently recruiting those people now. I should say Eric um, and Heather are working on recruiting those now. Um, really four major components to this. There's one-on-one -on -one instruction. There will be scholarships, including laptops, to allow for students who can't come in to the library to still participate. Uh, in the process, there'll be hotspots at other libraries besides Live Oak and uh, at a, some of the local museums. And the teacher coach will work with other teachers throughout the, um, the system to promote reader readiness. And I think the key thing here is, as I say, it's library based, and there will be testing at the beginning of the program and testing at the end of the program so we can really evaluate how well it went and um, make changes as needed for next year. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's kind of our key focus. Um, as I said, we uh, we said we would come up with $50,000 for that. Uh, this was our theme for Santa Cruz Gives. We got 25,000 from Santa Cruz Gives. Our friends at, uh, at Kaiser Permanente, and I think Joe Foster in particular, uh, gave us a grant for 7,000. Um, we have uh, the other funds of 11,000 that we're going to be de um, devoting to that. Um, and we also, uh, we applied for what's called an ERTC tax credit, which is a credit you get from the federal government for keeping people employed. And uh, we received $41,000 in checks this week from the IRS. It's kind of a treat I have to, say, to get a whole bunch of letters from the IRS that you're actually looking forward to getting. So with those funds, we're the board group releasing all the 50000 So whenever, as I've told um, Eric and Yolanda, whenever they're ready to ask for it, those funds are there and are ready to be delivered. Um, Probably not surprisingly, our, our second major thrust for the year is the, the downtown campaign that, uh, that Cynthia was just talking about. We have, as she mentioned, uh, had a couple of initial meetings um, and we are in the early stages of planning. Uh, so we participated in those meetings, Tracy participated in those meetings and we appreciate it. Um, we're really in the, in the very early stages. We're outlining what we need to do. We're putting an RFP together to find a good solid development professional to help us uh, with the process um, and identify key members of that committee. So if any of you know people you think would be good to work in that environment with us, we'd love to hear about it. Uh, did, did we mention that Brands of 40 is okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, we will be hosting the donor event, which will be on May 12th. This is probably going to be the largest donor event we've had so far by an order of magnitude. Um, the reason being that, you know, we had the Allison Ender children's room 
there were 160 separate donors um, to that sort of a crowdfunding approach to uh, um, to funding it, and uh, we've been asked to invite all of them um, to the donor event, and so we're going to be doing that. Uh, and so, as I say, it'll be a considerably larger donor event than we usually have. Um, we'll also have, of course, folks from the other major donors, which include the, the New Leaf Market, uh, the Angford family, the Coonerty family. Um, so it should be a great time. Hope you guys can all be there. Really delighted to have that thing finally because I'm I, I get emails all the time. I I have one ongoing conversation going on with a fellow whose mother-in-law is living in that uh, elderly folks home right across the street. Oh, yeah. And she just, it's like every three weeks or so, she wants to know. <laughs> so I'm really pleased it is for her. A um, couple of other things. We made the initial, our first disbursements of, of funds so far this year, uh, $23,000. That was for new laptops um, for after school STEAM programs. Um, I think these were to replace existing ones that had just gotten a little old and, and tired. Uh, so that happened a couple of months ago. Um, and finally, we have two new uh, board members, uh, Carrie Gunn, who many of you may know, um, longtime employee of the library system um, up at, uh, most recently up at Boulder Creek, uh, who is now retired and a very experienced library professional. So we're pleased to have her and, and her input. And also Dr. Albina Rapasane, um, she is a retired healthcare professional and educator. Uh, she is also a gifted poet. Uh, we connected with her in our relationship with the um, Santa Cruz uh, Writers of Color group. And so we're pleased to have her joining us as well. So that's the, the extent of my report. Anybody has any more questions? Well, I don't have a question. I just want to say thank you, Bruce. You you have done such an incredible job turning the friends around. I mean, where you're actually money you. is going out into programming and into the libraries. I really just want to thank you. And I love Recover and Thrive. I'm really excited by it. Yeah, so am I. Mm -hmm. So are all of us, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'll go on to member reports. Um, anything to report on? Um, I would like to also add my congratulations to Lindsay for her service. Yeah, thank you. She helped me, onboard me, and uh, just ran a wonderful meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really loved it. She'll be missed. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, I'm probably at the next meeting, once it fleshes out a little bit, I'm on a subcommittee for outreach to the community. Not so much doing the outreach, but uh, strategies for outreach to underserved portions of our community that just mm -hmm. don't have enough information about our library, their children, themselves, mm -hmm. their elders and their family. Um, there's a, whether it be language or, you know, being ghettoized socially or economically, but we need to, mm -hmm. to step out because it surprises me how many people don't know what we do and how well we do it. Um, I'm going to hold the consent calendar until Rena comes back in because it's an action item. And um, we will move on to general business, the summer reading program. And I think we're here with Heather. Hi. Good evening, everyone. My name is Heather Norquist, and I manage youth programming services for the library. I'm here along with Jessica McGibbon, our manager of the adult programs and services, to present our plan for a reading program this year. The theme this year is Find Your Voice. Last year, we enrolled 1,362 children, ages 0 to 11, 253 teens, and 571 adults. This summer, I mean, these numbers were less than we hoped for, probably because Aptos, Live Oak, and Grand Forty Graphics were closed. This year, we're making several changes in an effort to increase participation. Our community relations manager, Amanda Hotel, 
and our marketing department have come up with a design that combines the reading log with the event brochure. We're also including QR codes on bookmarks that take people directly to our summer reading page where they can sign up. We'll be promoting the program through print ads and social media as well. Here are some sample pages from the reading log and events calendar. All materials are bilingual. As before, readers can log their reading using the paper log or the feed staff platform. In addition to our usual and some clips, we're offering major raffle prizes for children and teens. Upon sign up, children and teens will receive a certificate for a free graphic novel from Atlantic Fantasy World. And then after five hours of reading, children ages zero to eleven will be given a book to keep from the selection of books in Spanish at a variety of age levels. Children and teens will also receive raffle tickets for 5, 10, 15, and 20 hours of reading. The grand prize for the raffle is a gift certificate for $500 to the bike shop of their choice. Other prizes include AirPods, seat headphones, and a variety of gift cards purchased from local businesses. Children and teens receive a sweet soup, coupons, and penny ice cream rooms for $20 of reading. Our youth librarians have come to offer a variety of fun, craft, and screen programs of every branch. Some highlights include collage journal covers, kids' karaoke, rock painting, and Lego challenge. We are still in the early ages of planning, but are hoping to provide two pop-up programs at ten within the meal sites. We will, we will find people up for summer reading and distribute free books and craft supplies. And I think one of my slides wasn't here. I didn't say what I wanted to say. But last year, we held all the performer events outside as we were still under COVID conditions. The net this necessitated is using off-site off locations for branches that didn't have adequate outdoor space. This year, we can bring our performer events back into the branches using our community rooms and outdoor areas when available. The friends have provided funding for two performers at each branch, and some chapters are funding additional performers. New offerings include um, Dungeons and Dragons, figure painting with puppeteer Ricky Benson, Python on, and the Traveling Lantern Theater. Good evening, Commissioners. I'm Jessica Goodman. I manage adult programs and services for the library system. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing for adults this summer. Um, so, you know, like the children's program, we also have raffle prize incentives. Um, those are at 5, 10, 15 hours of reading, and those are gift cards to local businesses. At 20 hours, we have a grand prize raffle, uh, which is for a family membership to the Museum of Art and History or to the Monterey Bay Library. Um, adult programs uh, are usually year round, so our regular programs are continuing all summer. Tech help, jail services, we do a lot of different things. They happen all summer. Um, we are also starting some new programs this spring that will continue into the summer. We are starting the Santa Cruz Poetry Project, which is poetry writing workshops at our Life Literacy Center. That's an offshoot of the Poetry in the Jails Project. We are starting a physics book club, which is led by a postdoc researcher from UC Santa Cruz. Um, and it is going to be incredibly fun. 
I should be really excited about that. Um, and we also are working on some home buyer education seminars. So those will probably be coming in June. On our Find Your Voice theme and our special programs, we are working with the Resource Center for Nonviolence to bring anti racism book circles to the public library audience. Those are going to be two small uh, reading groups, um, and they are led by experienced facilitators. And the idea is for people to come together and build understanding through deep conversations about extremely difficult topics. We are also going to be doing some bystander intervention training workshops, and those are where we can learn how to find our voice to speak up and help each other out um, and uh, reduce harm in our community. Um, we have some. Oh, sorry. That's too far. Huh. Okay, well, missing slide. I don't know. Um, we will have some um, creative arts programming. We'll have a local music concert that features our Soundswell digital music collection. That's a collection of local musicians. Um, so we'll be having a big festival for that. We will be offering some readers theater performances. Um, that is with Willing Suspension Armchair Theater. Those are theater people who do performances of uh, literary readings. And our next stage productions who do creative expression experiences for people over 50. We will also have creative expression opportunities for participants. We'll be doing some podcasting workshops, some poetry workshops, and some craft programs, um, doing some fun adult summer camp crafts like friendship bracelets, <laughs> all nostalgia there. And we'll be bringing in some local experts for a variety of talks. We will have our annual Shakespeare's Santa Cruz talk, that is the talk where they um, discuss this year's plays. We will have some genealogy workshops, including a workshop on writing your family's story and some local history talks, uh, details to come about what topics and where. Uh, and finally, we will um, be outside the library walls at annual community events. We will once again be at Santa Cruz Pride, Santa Cruz Juneteenth, and the Japanese Cultural Fair. Those are our summer reading programs for this year. Any questions from your panel? Mm -hmm. yeah. Any comments from the uh, public? Well, I was. It looks fantastic. I'm. I'm. I'm very excited about it. I'm really pleased that you're taking on some difficult civic-oriented programming. I'm. I'm really hopeful that that's going to be very, very successful. I'm excited. Thank you both. I'm going to go on to uh, the strategic communications plan. For the next presentation. All right. Hi, uh, Chair Community Commissioner. My name is Amanda Rapella. I am the new Community Relations Specialist for the Santa Cruz Public Library. I am uh, just about three months in. And as part of my work plan was to first create our strategic communications plan, which I will be walking you through today. So just a little agenda overview of what I'll be speaking to, providing you just sort of with an overview of the plan, the who, the how, the what, a little uh, overview of the work plan that I've laid out, and then uh, have some time for some questions. So starting off with our strategic communications plan. So really our overarching goals of the strategic communications plan is one, to support the overall library uh, strategic plan, and also position the organization to be more proactive and strategic in both internal and external communications. And a good strategic plan is a roadmap for the communications team. It really lays out the who, the what, the where, the why, and uh, the how. And um, it's something that becomes a working document that our team is using. And I can say for myself already, I look at this a couple times a week. So we're, we're meeting that goal. And the plan 
definitely will support all of the goals of the strategic plan, but in specific, these are the goals that are called out in the strategic plan that directly relate to communication. So promoting the library spaces and programs, uh, developing, developing a communication plan to expand reach and streamline communications, and then developing some of that annual marketing, um, including sort of awareness raising and also rebranding. Uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion is a big part of the library strategic plan, and it's something we're thinking a lot about in the marketing team. Um, you know, some of the, the things that we are kind of using to guide our work is using inclusive language, so making sure we're not using industry terms, avoiding acronyms, um, really thinking about photos and images that we use uh, being representative of, of our community. You'll see sort of in this PowerPoint, this is one example of, you know, being really thoughtful about the, what we're putting out to the community and what we're reflecting back to the community. We're doing a lot of translation of materials. We're going to kind of expand what you're seeing in the library in terms of Spanish translation. We're putting out a monthly Spanish, all Spanish language newsletter, um, and you know, really uh, working with our Spanish speaking librarians to sort of expand that reach there. And then working again with the librarians uh, to do you know direct outreach to underserved communities and partnering uh, with those organizations who are um, working in the community to get the word out about what's happening in the library. And then lastly, using an accessibility lens. Uh, I took a training last week that talked all about this, and there were some things I learned. You know, um, you don't want to underline things because it's difficult for dyslexic readers. You want to make sure to include, you know, alt text for screen readers so that if someone can't see an image, they can at least get the content from it. Uh, use camel case and hashtags, which is when you uh, have a capitalized letter for the first of every word in a hashtag both for a screen reader and also just for all of us because hashtag long hashtag are difficult to read. So those kind of things that we're trying to really make sure that we are inclusive and accessible. So who are we trying to reach? These are some of the audiences that we've out outlined. You know, we want to reach the general community. We want to be able to reach everyone. Um, but there are specific messaging and, uh, you know, communication channels that we use to reach different members of our um, audience. And so these are some of the ones that we've highlighted that may require sort of a specific channel or uh, specific messaging. And this is the sort of how are we doing it? So we have a number of different tools at our discretion, you know, from in-branch promotions, you've seen the digital displays and flyers, online promotions, and then using our website as a tool as well. Um, and you can see in the strategic plan, I sort of outlined, you know, the 50 plus tools that we have, but these are sort of some general categories. And I, I, if you've seen, we started putting out these uh, monthly brochures, which is sort of a one, one stop shop. So you can see everything happening in the library um, any given month. We did a bit of an analysis of that tool. And to our delight, uh, there were a ton of downloads, people in the libraries are using them. So that's another piece that we're looking at. We're looking at what tools do we have at our disposal and are people really using them? Uh, so video storytelling is a big piece of what we'll be doing. Uh, we've already started putting out a lot of videos. This is with author Angela Dalton, who is here at the Scotts Valley Library, um, really wanting to hear directly from, you know, authors that are in, uh, visiting our libraries. And at the end of this video, there's a, a um, interview with a patron that attended this event. So really wanting to, you know, hear from patrons and, and have patrons and people in our libraries helping to tell the story. And we're seeing just a lot of traction on social media with video content, which is really exciting to hear. Um, you can see this young woman here. She was she brought her Star Wars purse with her. <laughs> she was just like so thrilled uh, to be at this event. So marketing tiers, um, kind of the the how um, of of marketing and promotion. And this is in your your packet here, but really thinking about what are the different kinds of programming that we need to that we're doing in the library, the kinds of events, and breaking them into tiers because we can't do everything and so being really strategic about where we're putting our resources and this lays out a sort of outline of you know if we fall into this category this is the kind of promotion you'll get you know and so on and it makes it really clear for staff about what kind of promotion they can expect for their programs um, and then also you know for for us on the marketing team you know we have got just sort of a very clear flow of, of how we are processing sort of requests that come in from staff and, and can work collaboratively with our libraries doing the work. Additionally, uh, you can see also included in the strategic communications plan is what I'm calling the messaging architecture. So this here is provides sort of a breakdown of key messaging for various areas of the strategic plan. Um, you know, I kind of folded it into four areas. 
diversity, equity, and inclusion, safe and friendly spaces, support learning, and then engaging programs and resources. And so as part of this, there are some key messaging that can be used. Um, my team and I already, you know, when we're writing press releases, when we're writing social media posts, we've got content that's grab and go and easy to use. Sort of on the back of this document that we've created is then supporting content. So being able to really speak to data points and specific tangible things that we can speak to. So, you know, we're looking at engaging programs and resources. You've got key messaging, and then you can also speak to the fact that in fiscal year 1920, we held almost 4,000 free programs and events. So really trying to like provide some tangible, concrete um, content. Or the DEI, speaking to where our bookmobile goes and how many people are visited by the bookmobile. And this becomes something that we'll share out with all of our staff, we'll share with the friends, we'll share with you as well, so that we're all using the same language when we're speaking about the library and we have it just easily accessible. So as you're talking to people in the community, we're all kind of growing in the same direction and you have the tools to do that. So various work plan areas, and I'll kind of move through these quickly because you can dive into them in the strategic plan there, but uh, programs and resources is one such area. Let me find my notes. Okay, and some key tasks related to this are our marketing tiers, which you saw, doing a lot of updating of our internal processes, um, doing some analysis of our current tools, and launching a lot of into tools internally to kind of help streamline uh, how we're working as a team. Specific to community events, uh, we're working with the librarians to identify criteria for tabling at community events, and then figuring out what are the resources um, and promotional materials that are needed to be successful um, and, and help to amplify and get the word out at these events. Measure S, uh, you can see our goals here for Measure S. Um, some of our folk, my work plan part, uh, pieces are to update the Measure S page, which went a uh, new updated Measure S page went live today. So we're continuing to flush that out. But I think to you know Cynthia's point and her comments, you know, helping to tell the story of Measure S and really wanting to demonstrate the value for Measure S and continue to build that awareness and support. Um, we'll be doing some campaigns on completed projects, and then of course doing broad promotion of our remaining branch reopenings. Branding and marketing assets. So we like will be working sort of with the entire organization on a rebrand in the coming months, um, <clears throat> coming up with a social media plan, developing some updated brand guidelines, and then uh, we'll be coordinating on the website uh, redesign project with IT. I know you'll we'll be hearing from them at your next meeting. Media relations, really working on building relationships with our media partners, coordinating with them on storytelling. And I'm in the process of developing a paid media plan, which will kind of analyze our return on investment with various um, paid advertising opportunities and sort of map out where we'll be advertising for the year. And again, you know, storytelling is a big, uh, is one of my kind of personal areas that I enjoy and something that we're thinking a lot about. So you can see our poet laureate, Farnaz Fatimi, uh, he is doing uh, little mini videos for us all during Poetry Month um, and helping to kind of get the word out about Poetry Month and poetry and some of the poetry community that we have in Santa Cruz. So a lot of in-house videos, um, we're, we're analyzing the potential use of the library blog tool um, and really working to identify stories that we tell and then also we share with our media partners to help get the word out as well. And then internal communications, uh, really continuing to support, <clears throat> excuse me, our weekly email to staff, uh, analyzing our intranet and providing some recommendations around that. We'll, provide, we'll put out an annual staff survey, and then it's my goal to be out at the branches on sort of a quarterly basis, but I can be, you know, really engaging with staff, building those relationships and, and um, you know, engaging them in the work to kind of get the word out and be, be brand ambassadors. Um, I know there's a lot of librarians who are sort of camera shy, but it's my goal to get our librarians, um, you know, faces out there because I know people are really eager to, to get to know our team. And then lastly, emergency, emergency communications, which we have uh, gotten to deploy some of this work almost immediately. I think my first week on the job is <laughs> the first big storm of the year. So um, jumped in right away. And for me, I'm starting to outline what are when there is an emergency, you know, what is the communication flow with really the goal that both the community and staff know where to go for information during an emergency. So um, we've out, I've outlined a plan both internally and externally, and we're, we're working on that. Our admin team's been a really great partner. And I spent through all of that. So I will stop there and take questions. Um, but yeah, thank you.
Any questions? Yeah, I know a couple of questions. Yes. Um, well, first of all, this week I realized that because I have the app on my phone now, I don't go to the website anymore. Um, I order all my books on my app. I check yeah. out my app. I go, you know, I'm, I'm texted when my book comes in. So, um, but you have started doing monthly emails that talk about what's going on at the library this month. And that has pulled me back to the website. So, um, but I really appreciate that, that I'm now getting an email once a month from the library that's telling me like what's going on. So that's nice. But I, I, I think maybe you need to think about, because I bet a lot of people are like me now where we used to go to the website twice a week. And I don't think I've been on the website for several months now. That's so, really helpful feedback. Just, yeah, yeah that's it's working too well. Yeah, <laughs> isn't that funny? Um, so, and then my, my second question, this ties back to what Mike talked about early on about like, how do we reach the people that don't go to the library? Um, and you know, you said we need to do a committee and really spend some brain power kind of figuring out how to touch people. And I just love, I'm you're probably three months ahead of us. So mm -hmm. I'd love to just kind of hear how that process is going. I mean, of course, the bookmobile and you're doing tabling and things like that, but how else do we try to reach community members who don't naturally think of going to the library? Yeah, no, I appreciate that question. And it's something that I'm thinking a lot about as well. Is how do we, you know, all of our communication tools at the moment sort of are internally facing, mm -hmm. like they face people, you know, the signs are for people who are already in the library, the flyers. Mm -hmm. um, so we're thinking a lot about, you know, how are we amplifying and working with our partners on social media so that we're, you know, it's getting in front of eyes more broader than just the Santa Cruz public library lens. Um, I have dreams of kind of having a sort of email network where there is a program for youth. I have sort of a number of community organizations that we send the flyer out to and ask them to post. Um, it's part of the thing that I want to work with when we are, have fully deployed the librarian in every branch model, which will, you know, really have librarians engaging in the community, building those relationships with community partners, and able to kind of help get the word out and get our promotional materials out into the community. I know at uh, Boulder Creek already, <coughs> part of me, the branch manager is walking our flyers to local businesses, and part of that you know, um, I'm bringing flyers to local coffee shops. So really thinking about places where we can just get in front of people who aren't normally aware of uh, what we're doing. Um, so those are some of the tools, ways that we're thinking about it. But uh, but I, I think that's a big piece because I'm constantly coming into contact with people in my own circle who are like, you know, you, the library has telescopes you can rent or I had no idea there were park passes or that sounds like it's such a cool program. I had no idea that it was taking place. So the interest is there and I think it's just a matter of getting in front of people. So I'm thinking a lot about how can we expand our reach um, and would certainly be interested and excited in collaborating with the subcommittee. Right. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's just that I had a question. I mean, I sorry, I missed your presentation, but I had uh, looked it over because I am really excited about this. Um, I think for me, one of the goals that um, I know you have a lot about branding, but one of the goals for me with the marketing is just that even if people aren't going to use the library, like it's just that they know that the library is doing good things because it seems to me that that's part of um, uh, with advocacy that that's that's an important piece just uh, the tooting our own horn of you know like the goal isn't necessarily to get people to, who aren't participating to come in but just that they know all of these or that we're doing all of these good things so I don't you know no that's true know how we how we get that word out but I mean the library is amazing and you know, people don't really understand how crucial it is for veterans and for other populations. And I think I just think it's important. Yeah, I, I would say two things about that. Um, the first, we're trying to do a lot of that with our storytelling. So, you know, doing recap videos where people can, you know, are introduced to things that are happening in the library, uh, doing a lot of you know storytelling that way to kind of help get the word out. Um, I also have plans to do a whole campaign after we rebrand, sort of uh, reintroducing people to the library, which would, you know, uh, I can't remember, Yolan, you sent me videos from a library that just did sort of a, a great promotional videos, but, you know, utilizing our video storytelling to run at paid promotions and ads. I mean, I can't, I, I see, you know, local businesses and local organizations ads coming up on Hulu, 
And I'm like, we have to figure out how we get our videos. Like, where? how can I get a library video here? So those are some of the things that I'm thinking about. And, and I think um, sort of uh, reintroducing the community to the library with our new Measure S facilities, with a new brand in the coming year, sort of a really big opportunity we have ahead of us. Um, just sort of like, this is the perfect moment. You know, new logo, you know, mm -hmm. welcome to the library. It's relevant in your life. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Lena. Thank you. Any comments from the public? Uh, yes, I mean, um, I just want to, on behalf of friends, we just adore this lady. She is, you know, she's come in, she's met with us early, she met with our entire board, she's putting together a meeting with all the people. We have, you know, multiple chapters, each of which does their own marketing in sometimes a relatively disjointed way. And now we're going to be, you know, kind of brought together with a consistent theme and, and, and messaging and a consistent look and feel. And we're really, really excited about that. Um, and I, one other thing that I would add, Mike, to, to the question you had asked at the very beginning and that Rena brought up again, in our government pride, one of the important things for us is that there are going to be a lot of pieces that are directed at the parents of the children that we're working with. And one of the things we're going to be inquiring about is, yeah, how much do they use the library at the beginning? Does that change over time when their kids are going and going through these processes? And do they become more comfortable and more likely to be library mm -hmm. um, people, if you will? So. Mm -hmm. True. And she has a great reputation in the whole county. So, yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Right. Thank you. Thank uh, you. We're going to go back to the consent agenda. Since we have a quorum, yes. so is there any item on the consent agenda that anyone would like to pull or discuss? Anyone in the public? If not, we have a motion to approve consent. I move to approve the consent calendar. Consent second. agenda. Yeah. Thank you. Second. Second, Lorena. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. We'll go on to the dreaded library operator. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't need to. <laughs> the wonderfully hopeful library budget. Yeah, yeah. No, that's better. Okay. Um, you have to plug in the USB drive. Uh, um... Good, yeah, then that popped up earlier too, and it's still linked. Yeah. But yeah, go ahead and close it and open it again and, and click repair that time. That's what I did earlier in it. Um, and hit okay. There you go. Okay, one of my notes here is we have a lot to go over, so thank you all for being here this evening. I am very excited to be here to share with you the first draft of our 2024 uh, operating budget. So first, I just want to talk a little bit about our accomplishments in 2023. Um, as you know, it's been a very different year because we've had a number of branches that were closed. We've reopened a number of branches. And so um, in addition to uh, completing the strategic plan this year, we actually went from offering 240 open hours to the public to 422. So we almost doubled our hours and with almost the same amount of staff. So that's pretty impressive, I have to say. Um, we're really excited that we were able to open the Live Oak Library, this Scotts Valley branch, our Garfield Park branch, and on May 13th, we'll open Brand Supporty. We do have plans for opening the Live Oak Annex, um, hopefully before the end of June. We're looking at that. And then of course, Comptos will be opening in the fall. 
We established community-led learning modules. So this is a program that we began working on with our Felton friends, even though we've done the, our community leads, that the Felton friends program was a different model. And so we've been able to establish that. We met with them just last week to talk about what worked well, what could we improve, and how we push this out to do even more programming that's community-led. So we're excited about that. In addition, we received, uh, Heather talked a little bit about the Lunch in the Library program. So another great accomplishment, we received $23,525 towards our summer lunch at the library program. And another one, another one of the grants that we got was $114,625, and that was to upgrade all of our servers and infrastructure for high-speed broadband at our ranges. This is critical things that we really needed to do to be able to perform well for our public. So our strategic goals for 2022, and I know you've all seen the strategic plan that's in your packet, but some of the things that we really want to focus on this coming year is to really create a culture, an organizational culture of equity and inclusion. And we've seen that in our marketing plan to the programs that we're going to be offering, um, as well as being sure that we're continuing to provide safe and friendly spaces for our public. We're going to continue to do that through our branch openings that we have scheduled, but also our branches that have already opened, there are additional things that we will continue to do at those branches as well. We also want to make sure that our collections are relevant, that they are diverse, and that they engage the public. And so, again, some of those things that we're going to be working on that are in alignment with our strategic plan. So our 2024 work plan, I've included some of the highlights of that in your budget, uh, your draft budget book. Uh, on page 12, um, I think we talk about, I think it's page 12 in the booklet, but page 82 in your packet. Um, our 2024 work plan will continue to focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, as well as our materials, services, and training for our staff. We really we expect to get the Outcomes branch open in the fall of 2023 and are hopeful uh, that we will be able to get our much needed social worker in the downtown library. That's yes. another program that we've been really trying to achieve. Um, so we're really, a lot of that has been around hiring the staff, the social worker to be able to do that job. And so we're really hoping that as we progress in 2024, we'll be able to add that. I think that's a really critical service. Um, we are going to be looking at bringing forward Link Plus. I know this is something that I've talked about in the past. Um, Link Plus is, gives you the ability to borrow from other libraries around us. Even though we may not have it in our building, you can still look at it in the catalog and borrow it, say, from Napa or from Santa Clara County. If they have it on their shelf, it would be sent here. So you check it out just like you would any other poll. And so we're excited about trying to bring that program here to Santa Cruz County, as well as expanding our local history programming at the new Aptos Library. So we've got a whole history component there that we want to pursue and make sure we're progressing on. So we've talked a little bit in the past about our performance indicators. Um, some of that is going to revolve around our DEI plan. We uh, heard a little bit about the cover and run here from our friends at the library, the project that they're supporting, other early childhood literacy programs, and we're going to see how we can best support the community at all levels with their continuing learning journey, right? And um, we always want people to learn, and that's what the library really supports. We are putting a librarian at every branch, as we talked about, to be able to gain a deeper understanding at the neighborhood level, right? We've been operating, you know, kind of in a system-wide sort of zone, and we want to start talking about what does Aptos need, right? What does SoCal need, right? That's where having that librarian in every branch, they can really get in there into the outreach with the community. We've talked about how do we draw those people in who maybe aren't coming, or how do we let them know? I think 
that uh, commissioner, you had a great point. Like they may, maybe they don't want to come into the library, but they can still access our digital resources. They can learn online, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's making them aware that we have all of these things available, whether they walk in our facility or not, as well as we have a better understanding in our neighborhoods. Maybe we go outside the library and we do those programs that are part of our space, right? Mm -hmm. So that we can get that story out and tell more people about what we're doing. So I think that's a huge part of what we want to do. We're still going to continue to collect our visitor statistics, right? We put a lot of money and effort into the sensors, people counters that so we can understand what are the traffic patterns in our building. So we'll continue to keep those performance in indicators, but there's also these others that we're going to be really working on. What are the outcomes? And what is the outcome-based results that we're getting? And we'll be able to share those with you. So budget assumptions. Um, have a, a few different things listed here. Uh, one, uh, aligning revenue with the uh, library finance authority estimates. So last year uh, we met and they kind of predicted, you know, you're gonna get X amount of dollars based on sales tax revenue that has come in. And so one of the things that we found is the county is being a little bit conservative. So initially they projected some numbers that they gave us and we've reduced that by about 200,000 because we want to be conservative, right? Mm -hmm. We know that we potentially could be heading into an economic recession. We want to just be a little cautious mm -hmm. and not overspend. And so because of that, we reduced the estimates that we're using in the budget this year. But if that's what we get, that's great. Oh, well, it will be 200,000 for the good. <laughs> um, but we wanted to be a little conservative this year. Uh, in addition, I uh, talked about that assistant volunteer coordinator position. So this is one of those things that I think it's really important, right? We've heard from Amanda here, and I'm really so glad that we have her here because that's how you really get those programs out there. We yes. need that great marketing plan where people know what we're doing and know what the friends are doing. They understand the value of the work we do every day. Mm -hmm. And so being able to tell our story is important. So I want to take that assistant volunteer coordinator position which I'm going to tell you, it was a lower paying position. It was an assistant. The job that was being done wasn't really what the job description said. So now we're going to come into alignment and say that's the volunteer kind of person. But they also are going to work with marketing because a big piece of the marketing is bringing in the volunteers to help us do those events, right? To do the tablings, to do those types of uh, things. When we have our openings for library, brand new libraries, right? We get our volunteers to go out and, and work the cooking table, right? And so that's really important. Um, and so we want to shore up that position so we are strong. Um, in addition, we are requesting a 1.0 FTE, so a full-time person, to serve as adult services librarian at the Aptos Library when it opens. We do have a youth services librarian already dedicated to that location, but I believe that Aptos is going to have a huge turnout of people. I think it is going to be a community that is going to need both the youth the adult, and possibly even down the road, a teen dedicated librarian. Um, and we're looking at that across the system, but I think as this one opens up, that's going to be a position. It's a key position that we are going to need. Uh, projected increases in personnel costs, you know, our CalPERS is going up, our benefit costs are going up. All of those things are going to be uh, increasing in the budget. And I think that as you look through it, you will also see that we are going to be looking at sort of building that capital outlay. So each year we're supposed to put away uh, funding to be able to support infrastructure needs and capital projects. So we're, we're in a good place. But again, as we open the new branches now, there's other work that needs to be done. And so we want to be continue to be able to do that work so that our buildings do not fall in disrepair. We want to fix things as they need to be fixed so that it can be those great spaces that the public wants to continue to come to. Planning for organizational future. So I spoke a little bit about this earlier, but I talked about going using the RFP to hire a consultant. So we set aside in this budget some funding for that consultant 
that may change because we don't know ultimately it's an RFP process, but we wanted to make sure we're allocating some funds that would be dedicated with that consultant. Because I think for this organization to continue into the future and be fiscally solvent, we need to ask those questions now. Is it in our best interest? Do we need to pull away from the city and hire our own finance people? Do we form an administrative JPA with another organization? Do we contract those services out? What's going to be the best bet for us fiscally and for the long-term sustainability of this organization? And so that's one of the big things that we'll be taking a look at. And again, we have two years before this has to be done, but we better start now so that we know next year where we're going. Um, there's some small decreases in our system's operational costs. So as part of the budget process, um, Kira, uh, administrative principal management analyst, uh, uh, we sat down and we, we met with every manager and we said, okay, what is that? <laughs> Right. And so we went through every item and said, is that something we really need? Or is there something that would look better at a better cost? So we really took a good look at our budget and what we're spending and how we're spending it. And we asked them to make cuts where we needed to make cuts. And I think everybody came forth and did that. And so we were able to do some budget cutting and get some cost savings in that category because people went through and really looked at what the needs were. So one of the other great things that I think you'll, you'll see in this budget is that um, we really do have a pretty healthy fund balance. Um, but our revenue uh, is projected to the sales tax revenue. Again, we took that and did a little bit of a deduction. So let's be cautious. So our sales tax is projected to decrease about 1.3% because we made that cautious uh, decision. Uh, our MOE, that maintenance and effort, is projected to increase by 11.5%. So last year, you may recall, the board renegotiated the maintenance of effort for each organization. So City of Santa Cruz now is adding more money to that, um, and that amount that the City of Santa Cruz pays may change in a couple of years, because right now they are getting kind of a credit because they were doing this countywide service out of the downtown library. As we shift and we reopen all of our branches, the amount they pay is probably going to increase. Um, and this is where they came back and did their cost allocations. They hadn't updated those since 2012. And so that's <laughs> why our costs double. Mm -hmm. Uh, but they are agreeing, as I said, to honor that service agreement that we have. And so we'll be able to move forward for the next two years relatively safely. Um, and then overall revenue will increase by about 3.5% over the last year. Our operating expenditures and capital outlay, again, 2.6 decrease. That's where all the managers said, yeah, I don't need that. Right? I think we can make it with this. Oh, this one's a better price. Let's go for that one instead of that. We did some real soul searching and got about a 2.6 decrease in our overall um, outlays that uh, were not uh, personnel related. Books and materials, 8% uh, of revenues was augmented using trust funds. So we have a number of trust funds for the library. And one of the things that I heard when I came on board and the board kind of was very uh, insistent in saying, hey, we've got these trust funds sitting there. There's small amounts. Let's use them. Let's begin to use those rather than just letting them sit there. Um, and so we are going to begin to do that. Uh, obviously, the trust funds are dedicated to specific things. You can purchase you know, audio-visual materials. And so we will use those in accordance with the trust fund agreement. Um, but we are going to use some of our trust funds. And then the city services agreement, that is going to increase by about 4.5%. And that's according to the agreement that we signed back in 2016 that the city is going to continue to honor for the next two years. Uh, again, we kind of stacked in there a little bit of funding for that organizational consultant. We don't really know what the cost is, but we wanted to mark it in the budget. Um, and then capital outlay, we've increased by 50,000 as planned, 
until it's fully full funded at 400,000 a year. But again, we're going to start using that money because we've got it up there and now we can start with the first repair work we need to do. So personnel costs overall, 4.8% increase. Um, again, refers uh, that librarian, the reclassification. Uh, and then one of the interesting things, we have a vacancy factor that we've been using annually, which was about $770,000. It's just the number that we picked. Um, but we this year are going to use a seven-year average. So the seven-year average is about 10%. Um, and so, uh, you know, our goal is to get fully funded or fully uh, fill all our bases so that we are hiring people who can do the job that we need to do. Um, I kind of thought that the vacancy 10% was high. And then I went back and said, let's look at what, what happened be pre pandemic. It was higher pre pandemic. So we actually brought the vacancy rate down in the last couple of years. So I, I'm really pleased about that, that we're going to be seeing an increase in our staff. Um, so one of the big questions that we have, and I love input from you all here this evening, is on our Capitola Library. So we know that Capitola right now, I think I heard this earlier from Commissioner Wynn, that you know Capitola is, a lot of people are going there, they have really nice circulation, um, traffic count is up, better than downtown. <laughs> right, and so, but when app tossing, we did notice, and uh, you may have seen in the fact that there was the yeah. census people counter mm -hmm. data. You, you notice that after library opened, mm -hmm. Capitola's visitor count went down, right, because people could go back to their neighborhood library. So we're anticipating that when app toss opens, we are going to see a decline in the number of people visiting the Capitola branch. Now, Capitola and downtown are the only two locations that offer Sunday hours. Sunday hours cost us a lot of money because it is effectively you're burning a person to open for four hours a day, right? And so you almost have to run two shifts of staff, one shift to work Sunday through Thursday, right? And another to work Tuesday through Saturday. So that you can have give people their vacations, their breaks, all of those things. There, if they want to do training, if they want to attend a conference, so it really does become more costly to have Sundays than it would to go the straight Monday, Tuesday, Monday through Saturday, which is what we're doing at the other branches. So what we're looking at is the possibility of. We can add 3.0 FTE of regular staff members, and you can see the cost up there. That is what it would cost us annually to bring those three additional staff members on board. We are also considering, and what we've budgeted for currently in the budget we're seeing is a six-month pilot um, where we're going to cost it out about $10,000 to have um, continue running Sunday hours at Capitola when Aptos opens. And then give it a little bit of time where we can survey the public, but we can also look at what the visitor count is. Because Capitola, because it is such a popular location, there may not be in the club <laughs> right on Sundays. People mm -hmm. who maybe don't want to go downtown love that they can go to Capitola and they're over there shopping, right? It's easy access to get to the library. So, you know, those are things that we really want to think about. And I'd love your input on that today. Um, after the presentation is over. The other option is to close Capitola on Sundays beginning August 6th. And I say August 6th because we're anticipating that Aptos will open in September. We're anticipating that the building right now, like we're on track, right? And I'm so pleased. <laughs> it's great that we're on track. That means the building hopefully would be turned over to us at the end of July, beginning of August, yeah. and we're going to need the Aptos staff that are now working at Capitola <laughs> to go back to Aptos, which means we're not going to have enough staff to support Sunday hours at Capitola. So we have a decision to make. Um, so again, that's one of the things that I'd love to get your input on this evening. So as you can see, the library uh, plans to use currently about 305 thousand of our fund balance 
Um, and I think, you know, I talked earlier that our fund balance is in really good shape. As you can see there, we've got a committed fund balance, which is about 15% that we have to maintain. And then we have our uncommitted fund balance. And that's largely come from the salary savings that we've had every year, year over year over year. Um, and so we do have funding uh, to do some additional things, the, uh, the, the consultant, right? That we have one-time funding to be able to do that. We don't want to get into burning that by hiring a lot of people because that's going to burn that fund balance pretty quickly and we want to remain pretty healthy. Uh, so right this year, we are looking at utilizing some of that fund balance. Again, this might end up being lower if sales tax revenue comes out of the originally projected because we took that 200,000 on the hit. So this could balance out down the road. So with that, I know that's kind of a lot. You've got the budget books, the draft budget books in your packets that you can certainly look through, uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have at this time. Um, I just had, I had a question and then you can go into comments about Capitola when we're ready. But the first question, um, I know that we had a lot of temporary staff and there was a lot of um, issues about staffing just with temporary people. And I was just curious how that is and if that's changed and how that's affected the budget. So what we did, um, we took about half of the temporary staff budget to hire the 8.5 additional full-time equivalent regular paid positions. Okay. So I think we still are hiring for those positions. So if we get fully full, I think we'll be in much better shape we still kept half of the previous budget that we had for our temps that remains in this budget. Okay. Um, we are about 78% through the year at this point, and we're in good shape. We're, we're on track not to overspend, right? This has really required us to go to our branch managers and say, we really need you to schedule people. If somebody can't work on Monday, see if they can work on Saturday and swap their days, right? And we need you to plan in advance. If people are taking vacation, please let us know so we can have we can schedule people to cover days off when needed. And so we've been doing a lot of that. Um, it's like a learning curve, uh, but we're doing well. So we're on track to not overspend the temporary budget this year, which is great. Another piece of support that we get for temporary staff is from our friends in the library. So when we talk about recovering crime and needing additional tutors, the funds, the friends are funding some of that, those programs, and that includes some of the temporary tutors that we'll bring on because we know they're not going to be regular staff. Those are temporary positions. What I'm trying to do is right size us. So instead of calling everybody a temp, if you've been working that job for the last three years, guess what? You're not. Yeah. <laughs> and we should have that be a regular position. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we're trying right now to block that line and get people to where they should be. But we recognize there's still a need for some temporary staff. In addition, our fees. So those are the pages that kind of show uh -huh. so our fees are all under the temp budget. Um, <laughs> Good question. Mm -hmm. um, so, just trying to make sure I understand, you went through a lot of figures of um, you know, sales tax decreases, personnel costs plus 4.8%. So, are you, is the bottom line that you're, you're staying in an end where you take that $305,000 is what the increase will be? Is that so we would balance the budget if I took out that Aptos librarian, I took out the, we could have a balanced budget, but we wouldn't be adding the 1.0 librarian. We believe that that position would have been funded under the original projections where we were of sales tax revenue, but because we're being conservative now, it's it's looking like we can't fund it, we're going to fund the balance to, to take that money. So um, one of the things that, um, if you look at our budgets year after year, we typically borrow from the fund balance, 
And then we, but we never actually needed to use it. And this year we're coming out with about 2 million going back in the fund balance. So that means we didn't spend all the money we thought we were going to spend that we allocated. So I'm, I'm hoping that next year we're able to kind of balance out, uh, but we want to be, I'd rather be safe than sorry. And we do have a fund balance available for these, for these, um, the ability to have these positions filled. Um, and I think in the long term, the long run, that's a position that we need. Um, and it's definitely worthwhile. Um, I have a couple of comments and then I'd like to talk about capital when the time is right. Um, I have been one of those people that's been a proponent of spending the trust funds on what you know they were set aside for. I mean, I hate the thought of just sitting on money that people set aside for books and mysteries and technology. So I'm I'm very happy to see that you're doing that. And I also just wanted to say I'm impressed by how much you're doing with so with so little in terms of increases. I mean, you really have done a great job kind of threading this needle and and getting us a budget that's you know exactly where we ought to be. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I think that is important. I like to have a balanced budget. <laughs> so for me, the 300000 that we're leaving into the fund balance, I don't love it, but I know we have the money mm -hmm. and we've been really cautious. So I tend to be more fiscally conservative when it comes to spending money, which is why I went through with all of our managers and even um, with Heather and Jessica and our programming. And I said, hey, okay, the fun, are the friends funding that? <laughs> You know, yeah. because that's we get a lot of program funding from our friends, and I think it's really important that they get to put their name on that great program mm -hmm. as well because they do such a fantastic job of supporting us. We are forever grateful for what we do. <laughs> yes, um, I would agree. It was a little daunting to see something coming out of fund balance to balance the budget because it isn't really balanced, but I understand all the thought process behind it. 2025 was frightening, but thanks for you know projecting it out that far. Um, and I'd like to open it up for a discussion. Well, first of all, on the budget in general, before we get into Capitola, public, anything? Very nothing. Um, let's just go around. Hello, and, can I oh, <laughs> yes, please do. Please, please, please. <laughs> I hope I don't change your opinion of us. <laughs> um, a, a couple of things. Um, I'm not troubled at all by the the, the fund balance thing. I mean, if you look at the uncommitted funds balance for 2022, it's seven three, and for 20 at the end of 2023, it's seven six. So you're basically clawing back the 300,000 they grew, and so that that I can perfectly understand. Um, fines and forfeits interest me. Um, it averages seventeen thousand dollars a year for three years. And now it's going to be 122,000. And I am highly curious if this is a change, some kind of change in policy, or you're just expecting a lot of scoff laws. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, and actually, I think I would need to check in that because I think, as I recall, there were some, there was some, we were kind of offsetting something in the budget, but. You know, offhand, I cannot, I can look into that and give that to you. Okay. Because I don't want to speak. We still feel the same about you, by the way. <laughs> um, let's open it up for discussion about uh, Capitola. We'll start with Emma. What do you think of those three options? Um, yeah, I'm gonna, I think what you say makes sense, right? Right, right? right now, it's hard to make a good decision. So it was interesting that the choices were can spend um, 300,000 for three FTEs or 10,000 for temporary. Uh, I choose 10,000. <laughs> <laughs> I'm right there. <laughs> that, that sounds like an awfully uh, creative way. I'm not sure how you, how you get that, that, that cheap, but. Um, well, and I think it's because we're using temp staff. Yeah. So there's no benefits to it. There's no commitments, right? If we find that Capitola after two weeks, there's no business on Sundays, 
we can say that we, mm -hmm. we know that let's shut it down. Um, so, it, and we're, we're really looking at, in that instance, focusing on only bringing in those temps for like four hours a day, right, on Sundays, as opposed to with regular staff, we bring them in earlier because we give them their full benefits. Um, and so it, it becomes a little trickier when you have regular staff filling those positions. It's either um, one of the other things we've been looking at is, and this kind of goes with, uh, we're, we're looking at doing some partnering with the county, um, and that will probably go into this budget, which may increase our temp budget a little bit more, but they need to get their budget passed for state approval, and that's to do these community resource centers. So in the storms, when the county says, hey, Yvonne, can you open up the Scotts Valley Library community room? Um, and by the way, we need two, three staff members to open that up. They're going to fund the staffing because they're getting funding for the emergency services and we should be able to fund that and without having to have it just come out of our pockets and get nothing. Um, and so we're working on an arrangement with them. Um, but again, what's going to happen in that scenario, we're going to have to call staff down and say, oh, we're done for you. <laughs> oh, we're done. So now we're taking time and a half to get coverage. Uh, so that's where some of those costs, it can be a tremendous difference once you go to the regular benefited staff versus trying to do the, just a pilot program where we can run temps just to see what that traffic is and get some public input. Sorry, just, oh, just want to sorry. I mean, do you have any numbers today that says what is how does Sunday compare to Saturday? Sundays at Capitola are busy. Uh, they are. Um, and again, Capitola and downtown are the two only locations that do have Sunday hours. Um, and I think in your packet, there is probably some information in there with regard to in the uh, item about the end of the year, fiscal end of the year statistics for people counters um, that can give you more detailed information. We'll be having a new one. This quarter just ended. So that was the first capture of statistics in the one that was December 30th, which is in your packet. But then we will have more recent numbers. Um, that will be coming out uh, actually next evening because that quarter just ended, so we're still tanning in those statistics. Um, but Capitola does do a healthy volume of traffic on Sundays. Again, I've been down there, like if I go to Target or something, and mm -hmm. I'll swing by the library and the parking lot's full, right? And people are in there using the space. Um, so I recognize that it's a heavily used asset. It's really going to be a matter of how much of that is Aptos traffic mm -hmm. coming there now versus people who don't want to go downtown and will use Capitol on Sundays as mm -hmm. their place to go. You finished that? Yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, thanks, Yolan. So I remember when we had this conversation a couple of years ago about opening some Sunday hours, and you were there was kind of a regional approach, you know, so that people wouldn't have to always go to downtown to access kind of, you know, extra hours. Um, I like the middle approach because I think, you know, more knowledge is, is a good thing and to do a pilot and really see, you know, how things shake out. I, I would hate to see us just stop cold turkey, you know, in August, um, you know, and, and people who are used to going to the library at Sundays, on Sundays, just can't go anymore. And I, I think that's a great point. I know at Belton, as an example, we looked at how much traffic was coming into Belton on Sundays, and it just wasn't for mm -hmm. us keeping the building mm -hmm. open. We had two people in there, and we needed two, two to three staff to work it, right? So, you know, what's your, you know, that's probably not a good value mm -hmm. for, for what you're getting. So um, those are the kind of things that we'll be looking at. I'm going to anticipate that Capitola is going to have more traffic than what Belton had on Sundays. Um, but again, once Aptos opens, we'll be able to get better sense of that. I just had a question first. So if you closed Capitola on Saturdays and you had it, the work week for Capitola was Sunday through Friday. Is that the same? Is that the same? Um, you were talking about how it costs more. Is that the same thing that you're 
It would be it's six days a week. And so right. one, we have to give employees two days off in a row. Okay. And so it doesn't matter if they're Sunday and Saturday and Sunday or Sunday and Monday, which is why on those Sunday branches, we have we typically run them Sunday through Thursday. And we allow Thursday as the overlap day. And then the others are working through set, right? Through right. Saturday. Uh, Tuesday through Saturday, because uh, Thursdays gives us the opportunity if we do an all staff day okay. for everybody to participate in training, right? It's the one day we can count on, we got to hold everybody, right? But other than that, they may not even see each other if you're on one ship or the other. Right. Yeah. Okay. My, my thought was um, maybe unpopular, but I kind of um, am wondering if you should close it in the sense that as a user, it's very confusing when things are, when things shift around and we have this whole Aptos is opening and that to me is just kind of a natural time to change the hours. What I wouldn't want is to have it be kind of open and then closed at some weird, you know, just like closed sometime in October or in December. I don't know, to me just, getting used to what the hours are has always been, um, you know, they've changed so much over the last, you know, 20 years. And so it's it's just always kind of this refresh. So to me, like, as all of these branches are coming up, if we're increasing the hours, it's great, but I would almost rather stop, assess, and then increase, because no one's going to complain if we increase it. So if that's just, um, Another, I mean, ten thousand dollars isn't much. So if you want to continue it, that's fine. But I just think if you do continue it and then it's just dropped at some weird time, you're going to have more complaints than if it's dropped when Aptos is reopening. So and that's kind of what we did with Felton. We said, okay, Scotts Valley's opening. Felton, you're losing those hours. Right. right? And it's a natural progression. And what we really are looking to do is really provide equity across the system because yeah. we want every community to have, like, you know, then, then another community is going, well, how can they get to open on Sundays? But our, our library doesn't, right? It, it, it's funding, right? We mm -hmm. only have so much funding and we need to make good choices. And so, you know, uh, I think that, you know, coming up to the opening of Aptomas, we can continue to look at what those visitor counts are on Saturdays and Sundays and see what makes the most sense. Um, but typically Sunday is not as busy as another day of the week, right? But they are doing a lot of traffic on Sundays, so it's definitely worth working on. Um, but I, I hear you, which is why I'm Yes. Uh, it's no surprise that we're all leaning towards the middle one because it hasn't escaped me that you're a master of presentation. That's probably the one. But that's just not the one. But I really, I believe the B is good, and and for the only for the reason that, and the same reasons that you used, which is let's march along for a while and see. And I just hope that we test out the Aptos opening with Capitol opening open on Sunday long enough so that the newness of that toss can fade a little bit because it always does and, and see what it is. Capitol is a strange animal. Just if you look at the distribution of library cards that access it, they tend to be more from around the community as opposed to just Capitol community. It's, it's a very odd thing. It has must have to do with shopping. That's the only thing I can think of. And then it's a convenient path through the county during the day. Um, so. Yeah, I think the, the, the right approach would be the V option and $10,000 is money, but if we can get some counts and get some data, mm -hmm. that'd be great. Terrific. All right. I, I did have one more comment. Sure, sure. Um, I just don't want to discount Grant Supporty <laughs> opening. Grant <laughs> Supporty is my branch. <laughs> but I know that I've, you know, I'm more likely to go to Capitola now, even more than Live Oak, just because it's right off the freeway and everything. But, um, and I don't, you know, sorry, but downtown's not really my first choice. So, um, you know, it's, I just think once the Grant Supporty branch opens, I think a lot of the east side Santa Cruz people maybe. Um, accessing that or not, I don't know. That's true. And so, you know, May 13th, that great yes. <laughs>
they'll be able to see, see, right? Because I do, I anticipate that a lot of those, the people that live in that area are going to start going back to Grants yeah. 40, right? Mm -hmm. It's close to home. Yeah. And I think until we're 100% and we get the flagship open, yeah, that's going to change. Yes, yeah, and, it is. And, and I, it's my my hope, and what I think is going to happen when it opens is that it's going to increase um, the patronage everywhere. Yes, it's an interesting effect when you have that big main branch. It really breathes life into all branches. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So that'll be a big big. When thing. the new downtown branch opens, I think we're going to get ready to have our minds blown. Yeah. <laughs> It's yes. going to be so beautiful. It's just going to, I think, draw people into the facility. The whole system. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Cynthia. Um, a thought that I had, and you mentioned, someone mentioned Garfield. Um, when that opened, the friends, I think we had a little thing at the table. But it seems to me, for most people, they're not really separating the system from the friends. They're just saying, well, I've heard of services. It's, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. all the same end result. And there's this huge opportunity um, for the donor party, and I'm thinking at B40, and I expect the public party to be just humongous. <laughs> and I'm thinking about um, Amanda's opportunity about expanding the um, mailing list, the email list for the system and the friends, and if there could be some way, maybe Amanda and friends join them, just to keep pushing. If you want to know more, if you want to get the information, sign up. And you say sign up for the friends list, sign up for the library list. And I think, oh, blah, blah, blah. I mean, just make it super easy. Yeah. And if you want to support the library, join the friends. But a united pitch and something else I'm thinking, when you go to Shakespeare, Santa Cruz, or Symphony or anything else, before the program starts, the president comes down and says, we welcome you all this evening and if you'd like to support our program, here's how you do it. And I'm thinking every event and even every meeting, I mean, every library now has a gorgeous community room. Mm -hmm. And that should be part of the contract before you start your program. <laughs> you <just> say, <laughs> welcome to the library if you'd like to learn more and maybe even have some kind of a, a joint um, Sign me up. And the other thing, too, um, relative to all these branches and these heads, is if there could be some kind of a um, consolidated interest card, um, the branches, branches I identify with are, and you didn't have to choose one, but find out from your. I don't, I don't know if you guys are doing that now on the library emails or branches. We do have some information on that. I think. I mean, oh my God, what they know about us for anything we buy online. <laughs> quite serious. But yes, here, find out who's coming and give them more information. I, I will say that the tables that the friends have had out at Garfield, mm -hmm. and they did the what, what I love about the library. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The library. Yeah, yeah. I think that brought in so many people. Right, mm -hmm. we were able to get in contact with. I know we did something similar here for the opening of Scotts Valley, and I did attend the chapter, the Scotts Valley chapter, mm -hmm. chapter at their next meeting, and they had new members that came and said, "Oh, I'm going to join the Friends of the Library because of the outreach at that event." And Felton did that very effectively also on their mm -hmm. grand opening. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. it's a great way to join yeah. community members. And I guess my thought is you have to pay money to join the friends no. or you just sign join the mm -hmm. and make your name with them. Mm -hmm. And then do both groups use those names? Anyway, that's a question. <laughs> yeah, I mean the Aptos friends have about six hundred names mm -hmm. that we mail to once a month. Tell them what we're doing. Once a month, they don't get bombarded, you know. With OCR, they get a few more, just you know, it's this program, but other than that, it's once a month. So, and I think each of the chapters does send out mm -hmm. their own newsletter, yep. um, which are specifically to the individuals who okay. ask for that newsletter, and then with the library. Um, basically, if you ask for a card, we get on a mailing list, we'll send you anything. <laughs> Person 
the staff. I mean, we have over 40,000 people on our newsletter list, and we have a 60% open rate. Oh, that's great. great. So we have a very active mm -hmm. list. Oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. Go on. Thank you. Yeah, yes. Thank you. Oh, we were going to do one more. Yes, we are. There's one more item. There is. Cookies. Oh, there's, there's, cookies. Uh, there's, I never we're, forget cookies. We're moving on. There's, there's cookies. Oh, this is what everyone's been waiting for. Yes. There's two more. Right. Wait, there are a couple more things. Wait, does um, this one not require the National Library yeah. Week? An action. Yeah. Uh, it's been accept and file a proclamation for so, National Library so, so. Week, and I have been tasked with reading the proclamation. Okay. Because I think I'm signing the proclamation. Wow. <laughs> Whereas the Santa Cruz Public Libraries. Let's get some social media if you're reading this. <laughs> okay, I'm ready when you are. Are you ready? Okay, good. Whereas the Santa Cruz Public Libraries provide the opportunity for everyone to pursue their passions and engage in lifelong learning, allowing them to live their best life. Whereas the Santa Cruz Public Libraries serve as trusted institutions for all members of the community, regardless of race, ethnicity, creed, ability, sexual orientation, gender identity, or socioeconomic status. And whereas the Santa Cruz Public Libraries strive to develop and maintain programs and collections that are as diverse as the populations they serve and ensure equal equity of access for all. And whereas Santa Cruz Public Libraries adapt to the ever-changing needs of their communities, providing service and support to the Santa Cruz County during times of disaster and continually expanding their collections, services, and partnerships. And whereas the Santa Cruz Public Libraries play a critical role in the economic vitality of Santa Cruz County by providing internet and technology access, literacy skills, and support for job seekers, small businesses, and entrepreneurs. Whereas Santa Cruz Public Libraries are accessible and inclusive places that promote a sense of local connection advancing understanding, civic engagement, and shared community goals. And whereas the Santa Cruz Public Libraries are cornerstones of democracy, promoting the free exchange of information and ideas for all. And whereas the Santa Cruz Public Libraries, librarians, and library workers are joining library supporters and advocates across the nation to celebrate National Library Week. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Michael Termini, Santa Cruz Public Library's Library Advisory Commission Chairperson to hereby proclaim April 23rd to the 29th, 2023 as National Library Week. And during this week, I encourage all residents to visit their Santa Cruz Public Libraries, branch online or in person, to access and explore the wealth of resources available. Thank you. Here, here. <laughs> Very nice social meeting with the fireplace. Yeah. <laughs> Very empty I like it. <laughs> um, let's move on to cookies. Wait, do okay. you need to vote on this? To accept it? I think um, it's just accept. Do we want to remain all it? Let's have it. Okay, I'll make a motion. <laughs> Perfect. In a second. Okay. By Pamela. All in mm -hmm. favor? Yep. Aye. Aye. It's so proclamated and accepted. <laughs> Consider yourself proclamated and let's talk. <laughs> uh, that, is, that is for the day that um, we are going to. I think we're all going to go visit our libraries on Tuesday, um, April 25th, for National Library Workers Day. And where are the details? Do we BYOC bring our own cookies to them? Or? So, in the past, the library commissioners have each taken cookies out to a different branch. Mm -hmm. Um, you certainly probably have more experience with what you've done in the past, and if you all want to discuss if that's what you want to do this year, or if you want to do something different, that's certainly up to you. We just thought that this would be an opportunity for you all to make that decision. I think in the past, we've each adopted a library, yes. and we've each, you know, just taken something. several dozen cookies. Yeah. In the past, there was some, like, training day also, or some... Something is that happening? All staff training day is going to be on the 27th. Okay. Oh. That Thursday. <laughs> okay. Should we do it that day instead? Um Does that make more sense. <laughs> it, it's up to you. Um certainly that will take place here at Scotts Valley Library. So you would be delivering just to one place mm -hmm. as opposed to each of the branches. So that's 
again, this is up to how many the commission staff is there all together? Gosh, right now, where are we at? 115. <laughs> it seems like we should do the individual branches. They really liked the visit, I recall, last year. Yes. It, it, not, that yeah. a lot. Yeah. Just it, to have someone nice. from the LAC just even show up, mm -hmm. regardless of you know, what they were bringing. And it's nice. It gives you the opportunity to go out to the branch and mm -hmm. you can meet some of the staff and really, mm -hmm. you know, kind of, if you haven't been there yet, it's a great way to. Is it 10 o'clock? Is not a good time? I'm thinking tea time, you know. Okay. Probably break time. Branch is open at 10. So, right. so there we go. Timing. And right in time for the coffee break. And so, 40 yeah. won't be open yet. Okay. So we have Garfield, downtown, Live Oak, Capitola, Scotts Valley, Felton, and Boulder Creek. LaSalle. And LaSalle Beach, yeah. I think that's more branches than we have members. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I hate to add to your list, but you shouldn't forget the folks that work at headquarters. The IT staff will be at branches, and there's a lot of people that are sharing that building. Collection management. Yeah. 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 Are they going to be at the 27th? Yes. 27th sounding like more okay. like a. I know. <laughs> I can't get up this year. <laughs> So there's a lot of branches. And mm -hmm. Well, okay, so here's a logistics question. So can we discuss this by email without having a public meeting if we're only talking about cookies? <laughs> I think there's a brown ant cookie exception. <laughs> 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 Call out to the printer. Yeah. yeah. Listen, this is another thing is a seamless organization. Yeah. LAC and Krantz members being part of that. Mm -hmm. um, well, I was saying the Aptos friends I know have always done cookies on yeah. this day, but, um, you know, Aptos is closed, but we could go to, you know, we the could just take downtown. Cell, right? We could take downtown because oh. there are a lot of us and there are a lot of people downtown. That's what we did at Christmas. Aptos adopted downtown. Right. And we did the branch and the admin. So we could do that. Perhaps each member could choose a branch and we could look to the friends to fill in the gaps. We'd be happy to do that. Right? That'd be a good way to go. Okay. I'll take downtown. Okay. I'll do it with the Aptos friends. And, and I'll take Capitola. Okay. I see you're keeping a record of that. Thing. Yeah. You're going to remind us of that. And you'll take Scotts Valley, Pam. Great. Thanks. And I can do maybe should I do Garfield and my bow? You want to do two? You can do um, so we still have two, two members. We still have a couple of more members. Yeah. Well, I don't want to do Felton Boat Creek. Okay, so you would do Live Oak and Garfield? Yes. Well, I would have to do Felton. So we'll say the friends. And while you're up there, you can hit Boulder Creek. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I live here. I know. <laughs> And then who else are we missing from the LSD? Because maybe we could just assign them. Mm -hmm. Jennifer's in Felton and Boulder Creek area as well. Oh, okay. Jennifer and okay. Mary. Mary. And Mary downtown. So we will put that out via email. We know who has chosen branches already. We know we can fall back on the friends and we'll leave it, you know, for Mary. Good. Yeah, uh, I'm going to. Invoke the Brown Act cookie exemption, and I'm just going to send a, good, an email good, to the members good, and to Jennifer and to Mary and to Bruce, and we'll figure it out to say who's got which location. Mm -hmm. And then these are the ones where we have yeah. to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any, uh, it's not a policy decision, it's just for information. So we know yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're not, not voting on that. Okay. okay. Good. Good. Okay. Yes. Um, I would just ask for promotional purposes if I could be looped in. Um, you know, we love yes. the video, we deliver cookies. Yes. You know, it'll be a, it'll, it'll be some fun videos in here. So keep me in the loop. And in that in that email, could you include um, Yolanda Brush with your help? How many staff yes. members are yeah, yeah, yeah. be at okay. that time at that branch? Okay. Yeah, there's any. Guidelines about yeah, and how many would be calculations. Yeah. <laughs> and how many how many are gluten intolerant? <laughs> Don't get started. But we should think about that. Yes, yeah, that's right. Pam, do you have any connection with the Scotts Valley friends? Yes. 
Super, because maybe you, maybe someone would come with you for that. Sure. Okay, super. Great, Pam. Thank you, Patricia. Mm -hmm. And also, I think um, looking in Amanda, um, notify your local little local papers, Scott Valley, Aptos Times, blah, 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 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the media what time they're going to deliver the cookies, and mm -hmm. also to get op eds that week is national. Yeah, yeah. National library library week. week. Yeah. Super. And we can meet um, for grants of 40, even though before the grant opening. We, we are. Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, next item on the agenda is the scheduled up from the meeting, which is on May 8th. I am very sorry. I'm going to be out of town. I'm very sorry. It's okay. Yeah. Um, the new degree model of Branson 40 Library. Looking forward to seeing it. Seeing it. Um, any other items for the good of the order? If not, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How are you doing? Good kind of day. Well, I'm trying to make it.